Hi there. This presentation is on equipment used in food science. After this presentation, you should be able to name and identify the equipment and as well as be able to describe its function. So first thing we're gonna talk about is glassware. So glassware is generally used to store heat, mix and measure the volume of substances. So this can include beakers, graduated cylinders, all those fun things, Petri dishes. Um, some of our equipment is glassware, but I'm trying to switch over to make it plastic just so for um, safety reasons, so it doesn't break. So first, then we have the Erlenmeyer flask. This is used to mix and store liquids. The volumes range from 100 milliliters to 500 milliliters. And you can tell it's an Erlenmeyer flask is because it has this cone shape at the bottom. Next, we have test tubes. We're gonna be using test tubes in this class a lot. They are used to store heat and mix small amounts of liquids. So when we are heating a test tube, we always wanna make sure to point the tube away from you in case the liquid inside bubbles and steams and explodes. You do not want to heat a closed test tube. Um, test tubes can hold from 10 to 25 milliliters of liquid. Beakers. So beakers are also used to heat, mix, and temporarily store liquids. This does not accurately measure the volume of liquid. So if we're trying to put in 300 milliliters of a liquid into a beaker, we will first measure it in a graduated cylinder and then pour it into the beaker to ensure that we are completely accurate. Um, beaker's volume ranges from 100 milliliters to 1,000 milliliters. <laughs> Next, we're gonna talk about tools used for making measurements. So we are gonna use the metric units as outlined in lab instructions. So in cooking, we use cups and uh, tablespoons, but in food science, we are going to be using the metric system. So milliliters, liters, that kind of thing. All right, so graduated cylinders are used to accurately measure the volume of a liquid in milliliters. So when we are measuring, we wanna make sure that we always set it on a flat surface. We wanna read the bottom of the meniscus, which is the curve at the, um, at the top, um, at eye level to find the volume of the liquid. So we have all sorts of different sizes of graduated cylinders. We have our 10 milliliters, 100 milliliters, and 1,000 milliliters. Yeah, we're going to learn how to uh, measure liquids accurately and precisely using graduated cylinders. It's very important when you measure any type of liquid, you use a graduated cylinder like these. Um, you do not want to use a beaker or a flask because those aren't calibrated to uh, measure liquids accurately. So stay away from beakers and flasks. I know they have hash marks on them but those aren't as accurate and precise as a graduated cylinder. Those are just general estimations. So if we look at our two graduated cylinders here, we have a large one and we have a small one. Each one is different. So it's always important to pay attention to what type of graduated cylinder you have. So the hashes for each one can be different. So if we look at the large one on the right, the Larger hashes are one milliliter markings and the 0.5 milliliter markings are smaller hashes. So that's for a larger graduated cylinder. And if we look on the left, we have a different hash system. So the larger lines are one milliliter markings, but the smaller ones are now 0.2 milliliter markings. So when you take measurements, you wanna take it to the 10th place. So for example, um, 8.5 milliliters would be a good reading rather than just eight milliliters or 8.52 milliliters. So if we fill both of these graduated cylinders up, let's try to take an accurate measurement of the two uh, liquids, okay? So if you look at the hand on the screen, now my little pointer, let's try to measure out uh, the volume 
on the smaller graduated cylinder. So if we look here, this line here is a seven milliliter mark. So if you remember, these little hashes are 0.2 milliliter marks. So this is seven, 7.2, 7.4, right? The meniscus looks like it falls underneath uh, the 7.4. So you could say an accurate reading would be 7.3 milliliters, okay? Now, if you said 7.4, that's not bad, okay? That's acceptable. So now let's look at the graduated cylinder on the right. Here we have 15 milliliters. And if you remember, these hashes, right, they're hidden here. Each one represents one milliliter. So if this is 15, this one is 16, there would be one that's here 17, 18, 19, 20, right? And if you remember, the ones in the middle are 0.5. So if this is 15, this is 15.5, then this would be 16. And from 16, this is 16.5, and up here would be 17. So it's very difficult to see a meniscus here, but it should fall somewhere within this range. So if this is 15, this is 16, and then 17 is right here, you can probably say the meniscus is somewhere in here, right? It's a little difficult to see. You can kind of see a little bit over here. Now, you can say an accurate reading for this would be, this is 16, this is 16.5, maybe somewhere around 16.8, because the meniscus is definitely under the 17 milliliter mark. So 16.8, 16.9 milliliters would be a good reading for the graduated cylinder on the right. All right, so next we have the electronic balance versus the US measuring cups. So in our, my intro to culinary class, you have probably seen these measuring cups before. Um, in science, though, we are going to be using a lot of the time our scales because we're gonna be measuring by weight. Measuring by weight is a lot more accurate than measuring by volume. So when you're using the digital scale, you wanna make sure to turn the power on first before placing anything on the scale. So these are scales can measure the mass of an object up to 500 grams. Um, every time we use our scale, we need to make sure it is calibrated before each use. That means it's zeroed out. So it's, an, it's telling you an accurate reading. Um, when we are in person and we are practicing, I will show you how to do this. And what's also important is using our scale on a flat surface. Understanding the difference between weighing food and measuring food can be challenging to new and experienced employees. Here are the basic rules. 1. Liquid foods should be measured in volume containers such as cups, quarts, or gallons, simply filled to the line for the amount desired. 2. Dry foods may be weighed or measured. Weighing dry foods is more accurate than measuring because Foods have different densities and amounts of air, so the same weight may not measure the same. Also, measuring can be inaccurate among the staff. Three, if the recipe calls for measure of dry foods, such as flour, use a scoop to place the flour in the measure, then level off with a flat edge utensil. Four, dry foods may be weighed on a manual or electronic scale. Place the container on the manual scale, then turn the dial to zero. If the dial is stationary, record the amount of the container. If additional ingredients are needed, tear the scale back to zero and weigh the next item. Weigh the amount of food needed. Five, if using an electronic scale, press the tear button to return the scale to zero or place the container on the scale before you turn it on, then it starts at zero. So how do weights and measures get tangled in your mind? When you use the measure as a weight, you're likely to end up with the wrong amount. For example, 
If your recipe calls for eight ounces of shredded cheese, you measure one cup, you're missing half your cheese. To convert the weight to measure, weigh the ingredient first, then transfer the amount to the appropriate measure. Review your recipe carefully to prevent kitchen catastrophes before it's too late. So our first lab um, for this class is going to be measuring accurately. So you get to try all of those things firsthand yourself. <clears throat> right, next, we have a thermometer. So a thermometer is used to measure the temperature of a substance. Um, the temperature is measured in degrees Celsius. The rubber triangle ring prevents the thermometer from rolling off of a surface. So this right here, this little rubber thing is going to help make it stationary. Our thermometers at school look a little bit different from this, but pretty much it's the same gist. Just in case you need it. This is a thermometer. As you can see, the thermometer often comes in one of these yellow protective cases. When handling the thermometer, make sure you try not to hold it by the bulb as that will influence the temperature that you are looking to read. Um, the thermometer is precise to 0 0.2 degrees Celsius and has a, a range of negative 20 to 110 degrees Celsius. When using the thermometer, avoid exceeding this range, so do not go over 110 degrees Celsius. And in any case, do not go under negative 20 degrees Celsius. When using the thermometer, what you want to make sure is that the thermometer is actually within your liquid and not touching the bottom of your beaker. Uh, in the case that it's on a hot plate, the hot plate and the base of the beaker will be much hotter um, than the solution itself, which could pose a risk of uh, exceeding the reading limit of the thermometer. Okay. All right, next we have the light microscope. So the light microscope is used to magnify objects 40, 100, or 400 times its original size. So I said in the beginning of this class, one thing that is the coolest thing we look underneath the microscope is fudge and how it crystallizes. And um, it's really cool. All how to correctly use one of our brand new expensive microscopes. First, take the slide. Always make sure the microscope is on low power first, which is usually the one with the red stripe. Next, place the slide on the stage and clamp it down so it doesn't go anywhere. Next, you can turn the microscope on. Look into the lens and use these bigger knobs called the coarse focus knobs to focus your image. If you want to see it closer, turn it to middle power, which usually has a yellow stripe. Use the coarse focus knobs once again. If you want to see it even closer, turn it to high power, which has a blue stripe. With high power, you can only use the fine focus knobs to focus your image. Wow, that's a great image. I want to share it with my partner, but I don't move the whole microscope because you always want to keep the microscope away from the edge of the table. Instead, I can just turn the lens like this. Josh, you want to see my image? Ooh, hair. Okay, that was cool. Now let's turn the microscope off. Always, always, always make sure you turn it back to the lowest power before turning it off. All right, so one of the things you're going to be putting your um, objects on to look under the microscope is on these slides. So slides or objects to be viewed under the microscope are generally placed on a glass slide. <clears throat> then we have our cover slips. So the cover slips are a plastic or glass transparent square, which is smaller than the slide that's used to cover an object placed on a slide. 
So these cover slips, they aid in protecting the lens of a light microscope and keeping objects viewed under the microscope in place. Um, when we're gonna practice putting cover slips onto our slides, because we have to avoid having any kind of air, pop, uh, air bubbles underneath that uh, forming underneath the cover slips. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about some lab accessories. So lab accessories, these are pieces of equipment that are used with glassware, tools for making measurements and the microscope. So one thing you might be using is a test tube holder. So a test tube holder is used to safely hold hot or cold test tubes. Um, they, you want to use heat resistant gloves when heating a test tube with the test tube holder, because as you can see, it's um, metal and so it's going, it might heat up. Uh, the ones that we have in class, some of them do have rubber um, handles that will help it from getting hot, but you still just want to be safe than sorry and use heat resistant gloves. Next, we have a plastic pipette. So a plastic disposable dropper used to transfer small amounts of liquids. Um, these can hold one milliliter to five milliliters of liquid. And um, you wanna make sure to check that it's clean before you are using it. Do not transfer two or more liquids with the same pipette. So we wanna make sure it's a brand new pipette. Here's a video. this video, you will learn how to use a transfer pipette. We will be using a disposable plastic transfer pipette, or DPTP, also called a transfer or bowl pipette. Transfer pipettes are often available in individual sterilized packages for microbiological work. This is a one milliliter graduated disposable plastic transfer pipette. The pipette has a bulb that is connected to a shaft. Markings on the pipette allow the measurement of one milliliter, 750 microliters, 500 microliters, 250 microliters, 100 microliters, and 50 microliters. To transfer a solution, start by gently squeezing the bulb and placing the tip into the solution. Then slowly release the pressure until the solution partially fills the bulb. Then slowly apply pressure on the bulb until the solution reaches the desired volume. Then holding steady pressure on the bulb, move the pipette to where you wish to transfer the solution and slowly apply pressure on the bulb to dispense the liquid. Okay. All right, next we have butane burners. So we're not gonna be using butane in this class. We're gonna be mostly using our, our new induction cooktops, but normally butane burners, they are used to slowly heat liquids and keep them at a constant temperature. Hot glassware looks like cold glassware. So use heat resistant gloves when handling glassware from a hot plate. So you always have to make sure when we are heating up um, our liquids using our glassware that you're either using the test tube to, um, holders or you are using your heat resistant gloves, which brings us to the next item, which are heat resistant gloves or oven mitts. So these are used to safely handle hot or cold glassware. They are not flame resistant, so they still burn, they still can catch on fire. So you wanna keep them away from any open flames or anything like that, which you shouldn't have in class anyways. <laughs> All right, next you have forceps or tweezers. So these are used to handle objects that are too small for you to grasp and manipulate with your own hands like cover slips. Um, and they are not for plucking your eyebrows, even though they may look like the same ones that you pluck your eyebrows with. It's not what their use is for in my classroom. All right, guys. <laughs> All right, next we have our test tube rack. So these test tube racks are gonna be used to safely store test tubes. And we have our mortar and pestle. So these are used to grind solids into small fine particles. 
So like when we are breaking down and um, testing the amount of proteins or how long it takes or how many uh, calories are in food items, we will be grinding them down use, using a mortar and pestle. Um, also like our when we make cheese, we'll be grinding down our rennet in a mortar and pestle. All right, next is goggles. So goggles are protective eyewear to prevent chemicals and objects from harming your eyes. Uh, so we wanna wear these to protect any kind of hot liquid or any kind of chemical getting into your eyes. Um, they must be worn at all times during lab, lab activities and less specified. It's just to help you guys out. All right, and then we have a funnel. So funnels are used for guiding liquids down narrow openings like those found on a flask or test tube. Um, sometimes we put them, it will like use a funnel for our plastic, like when we need to squeeze, put things in the squeeze bottle. All right, next we have our Petri dishes. So a Petri dish is a small plastic container used to culture microbes or store some small amounts of substance. It has many practical uses. Um, so the larger side of the Petri dish, so like this side, is considered the top or the cover of the dish, and the thinner, smaller side is the thing that you put your um, substance in. So we are going to be using Petri dishes to see how um, bacteria grows in certain different types of foods, um, and so we'll be using Petri dishes for that. All right, we have our glass stirring rods. So these are used to mix chemicals and glassware. So stirring rods will have a flagged end to indicate which side to safely hold on to. We have to be very careful with these. I've actually cut myself last year using one to stir um, a sugary liquid and I cut myself. So we have to be very careful and um, not, not break them. Hand lens. So hand lenses, hand lenses are used to view the details of smaller objects that are hard to see with your own eyes. So when we're gonna be learning all about different um, um, vitamins and minerals, and we're gonna be testing different cereals to see how much iron is in each cereal, and you're gonna be using your hands lens, hand lenses to magnify to see the iron particles in your cereal. So they magnify the image of objects two times to 10 times larger. Okay, so we don't have Canvas, but do in Microsoft Teams. I am going to be posting a Quizlet that, to go along with this presentation, and you are going to be completing the Quizlet um, for your assignment today. Have a good one, guys.